Stars, good morning. Hey, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about vision, uh, team meetings, and uh, back in May when we talked about vision and we began to release the vision for the for the next five or six years here at Salem Fields Community Church, we talked about vision meetings where you could get involved and you can give us feedback on how we engage the vision in the areas of giving, prayer, reaching, and serving. And so those vision meetings are coming up. You see the dates on the screen at 7 p.m. in the Rubicon Cafe. You can view them live or you can do them online. But what those meetings are all about is you giving us suggestions on how we might live out as a community the vision that God has placed before us. And so we wanted to not just kind of come to you and say, here's what we're doing and here's how we're going to do it. We want you involved. We want this to be a grassroots effort in enlivening this vision and making it happen in our community. So we're excited about those things. And uh, you can take those dates, write them down. You can attend any of those meetings. We'll just take suggestions all the way around in any of those meetings. So just pick a meeting and jump online. We'll send out those We'll be sending out those Zoom links so that you can get on a Zoom link or you can attend live in the cafe. Hey, I also want to uh, thank a lot of folks for a great, great Labor Day weekend fireworks celebration that took place uh, last Sunday. Kim Huffman and her team, a lot of volunteers, a lot of you who are out here in the auditorium or online jumped in and helped and made it happen. And it was a great Great event. And that event was all about and connecting with our community and giving our community something to celebrate in this long kind of a COVID uh, nightmare that we've been in. So thank you so much for your participation. And all that stuff happens because, because you serve and because you give. It doesn't happen unless you serve and jump in and volunteer and give and make that happen. That's the only way it happens. So I appreciate all of those who, who jumped in and served and gave and, and made that happen. We want to say thank you so much. Hey, so we're in the middle of a series called Real Relationships. And uh, we've been talking about what it means to invest in people, uh, what it means to mentor people or come along people and empower them to be the best that they can be in the kingdom of God. So the homework I gave you last week was this question. Who are you investing in and who's investing in you? And here's my hope. My hope is by the time we get finished this series, you will be able to answer the question, who is investing in you and who are you investing in? Have you ever made uh, or, or, or had ever had an investment or an out investment, an in investment or an out investment. I'm going to make up some words today. I'm going to talk about investments and outvestments. And so you'll know anything about me. I make my own words up and you'll get to learn the words and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when I get finished today. So have you ever invested in something? Have you invested in something? I mean, and taken whatever you have gained through that investment and kind of paid it forward into another investment? We do that all the time. We take a stock. We take some kind of dividend and we invest in it. And then we make residue money off of it and take it and put it in something else. Maybe you invested in a house. So you have a house and you have equity. And you have that equity and you take that equity and you put it towards something else. And you continue to take that investment and pay it forward. As great as that is, and we call that good financial investment, as great as that is, it's so much more greater to invest in a person and see that person go and invest in someone else and the circle continues to go and go and go. And the reason why that's so important is those investments last for eternity. The stuff that we will invest in here, the Bible talks about it, it will rust out, it will wear out, it will one day be torn down. But when you invest in people and people invest in other people, that that kind of investment is an eternal investment. So we're, we're going to, we've been talking about real relationships. Let me, let me explain what I mean by real because someone said, James, all my relationships are real. Yeah, they are. But when I talk about real relationships, I'm talking about relationships that are God-based, other-directed, and hope-giving. They're God-based relationships. They start with vertical. The foundation of the relationship is a God relationship. Because God is the one who helps us to have real and sustain real relationships. God-based, others, others directed, directed into other people and life-giving or hope-giving, real relationships. My life has been about paying forward the investment of other people. 
the investment of people have made in my life, pastors and people from churches and professors and parents have all invested deeply in me, and I have, I have tried to pay forward the investment of others. So today, I want to show you what happens in the life of the, in the life of the kingdom of God, when people invest in a person, that person outvests in someone else. See, because when that happens, the kingdom of God grows and people's lives are changed. And I want to talk about that through the life of Jethro, Moses, and Joshua. Now, let me give you some background. Moses, you might know of. Moses is the one that God used to bring people out of Egypt into the promised land. He was the one that God used to start a new nation. Well, Jephro was his father-in-law, and Joshua was his mentee. And through those three lives, we see what happens when you invest and outvest in the lives of other people. There's so much we can learn by, about their relationship. First of all, they had a close relationship. The Bible says in Exodus 18, Jephro, priest of Midian, and the father-in-law to Moses heard the report of all God had done for Moses and Israel, his people, the news that God had delivered Israel from Egypt. So Jephro stayed behind, is out in the wilderness, and he hears the good news of how God has used his son-in-law to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt and to rescue them from the hand of Pharaoh. It goes on. Jephro, Moses' father-in-law, brought Moses and his son and his wife there in the wilderness where he was camped at the mountain of God. He has set a message to, ahead of Moses. I, your father-in-law, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons. Moses went out to welcome his father-in-law. He bowed to him and kissed him. Each asked each other how things had been with him. And then they went into the tent. They had this close relationship. If you're going to invest and outvest, you're, you need to have a close relationship. And they had one. Just look at how, how the scripture says they, they asked how each other was going, doing. They talked with one another. They appreciated one another. They had a close relationship. No doubt that relationship had been cultivated over 40 years Forty years Moses hung out in the desert before he went back to rescue the people and bring them out of Egypt. And no doubt his father-in-law was there. Remember, Moses was a guy on the run. He had tried 40 years earlier to do something about his people in slavery. And he had killed an Egyptian and they had a price on his head. And so Moses ran out to the desert and began to tend sheep in the desert. No doubt they had many conversations father-in-law and son-in-law during that time. The Bible says that Moses in Exodus 3, 1, Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the west end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God, Horab. This relationship, Moses is tending Jethro's sheep, hanging out together. Investment is all about relationship. Without a close relationship built by trust and love and, and honesty and mutual commitment, mentoring or investing in someone will never work. The other thing that has to happen to, if we're going to invest in people is transparency. Exodus 18.8, Moses told his father-in-law the story of all that God had done to Pharaoh in Egypt in helping Israel, all the trouble they ex experienced on the journey and how God had delivered them. Moses was willing to be vulnerable. That's a, that's a bad word in, to, in today's culture. There, there's a sense where we understand that vulnerability builds relationships and vulnerability helps us, but no one wants to be vulnerable. See, Moses was willing to share his fears. No doubt that when Moses got called by God to, to go and lead the people out, I'm sure he had a, a conversation with his father-in-law who he's really close with. And, I, and I, I'm, my sense is he was willing to admit his fears, his weaknesses, his mistakes, his concerns. Remember, Moses was the one with the, with the messed up tongue, the one who stuttered, the one who could not and would not be used of God. And so as God uses Moses and, and Aaron and he comes back and he shares all of this with his father-in-law. Let me stop here and say it's hard to do 
real relationship with our vulnerability. At the age of 36, I was here at Salem Fields Community Church, executive pastor, and all the stuff in my life that I had never dealt with began to kind of creep up in my life again. All the stuff of kind of being in foster care and feeling abandoned and all of that stuff began to creep up and it began to play its life, its way out in my relationships. And, and here's what I did. I figured that since I had been hurt by some of the people that, that, that were supposed to love me, that the way I would deal with my, my life was I would become the Teflon Hayward. Teflon Hayward, and, and the way that worked is, is, is they, they used to call Ronald Reagan the Teflon president, and I like that. You know, nothing affects me. Everything slides off my back, and so I decided I was going to do relationship that way, and I would never let people get close to me. Well, that wasn't working because it started to unravel in my life, and so I left here, and I went up north to become a lead pastor, and one of the first things I did is I found a therapist, a Christian therapist. And her name was Hadrika Vandekamp, and she was not impressed with me. I loved it. Loved it that she was not impressed with me. Loved it. She was not impressed with pastors. She had had a pastor as a husband who had divorced her and left her. She had dealt with pastors at Fuller Theological Seminary. She taught there. She knew pastors. She was not impressed with pastors. And so I was doing my Teflon thing with her, and she said to me, or it seemed like she said to me, James, if you want to pay me $300 to sit here and talk on the surface, I will take your money. But she shared with me during those sessions one of the greatest lessons I've ever learned about relationship. She said to me, James, relationship is not about Teflon. Remember how Teflon worked? Teflon was the coating that we put on pants to keep things from sticking. They're not about Teflon, they're about Velcro. Like that was the opposite of what I wanted to hear. Like I could have paid her $1,000 and I still, I would have paid her off not to tell me that because that was the opposite of the way I was living life at the time. And so she was saying, no, it's not about things slipping off your back. Real relationships is about vulnerability. Real relationship is about getting close with boundaries, but getting close and so I, I, I learned the hard lesson that when you're going to do real relationship, vulnerability, transparency, and stick to of this matter if you're going to do real relationship. If we're going to invest in others, we have to be transparent. The other thing that, that uh, uh, if you're going to invest in someone, if you're going to invest and outvest, there has to be this sense where you desire the best for the person that you're investing in or outvesting in. You got to desire the best for them. In our culture, you know what we do? We kind of, we get jealous when someone gets ahead. We get jealous when someone is doing better. And so what do we do? We take and put all the good things on Instagram about our lives and all the great pictures. We only share on Facebook what's happening great. Now, every now and then there's a person that only shares what's happening bad. But I think that's the reverse of the same coin. It's the same exact thing. It's just the reverse side of that coin. And so there's a sense where you have to be desiring the best for that person. Jephthah was delighted in all the good that God had done for Israel in delivering them from Egypt's oppression. Jephthah said, blessed be God who has delivered you from the power of Egypt and Pharaoh, who has delivered his people from the oppression of Egypt. Now I know that God is greater than all gods because he's done this to all those who treated Israel arrogantly. Jephro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And he began to, the Bible goes on to say, he began to call all the elders together and eat a meal with Moses. Jephro was excited about how God had blessed and used Moses. Moses' victory was Jephro's victory. He was happy when things were going good for Moses. He got at least as excited, if not more excited, over what God did with Moses than what God was doing with him. It's this sense of needing to learn how to celebrate things when they are going well. Real relationships. Investment gets excited when people are doing well. The other thing that's really interesting about Jephro and Moses' story is this. Jephro was making positive, positive investments in Moses. 
There's a story about Moses. Uh, You know, it's one thing to get people out of Egypt. It's another thing to make a nation of them. So Moses is making a nation of this people who have no national identity. They've been in slavery for a long, long time. No national identity. And so he begins to take the law that he's received from God and begins to set up a nation and the story goes that Moses was the, he was everything in the nation. He was the judge, the jury, and the executioner. He was everything. And so Moses was set up and, and there would be these squabbles in the community, um, not unlike today, right? Squabbles in the community. And they would come to Moses and they would discuss the squabble and Moses would make a judgment based on God's law. But the problem is people estimated there, there were about a million people that came out of Egypt to come into the desert. And so can you imagine the line? The line is going out this building and down Gordon Avenue and and they're waiting one at a time to tell their story. You know how you tell the story? Everybody's got their part of the story. So this person's story is different than this person. And they're going on and on and on. And Jethro sees this and sees how long the line is and says, Moses, what are you doing? This is not working. It's not working for you because you're going to get burned out. It's not working for the people because they're taking a long time. you got to do something better than this. And so Jephro begins to instruct Moses. says, Moses, why don't you uh, find some people who are wise people and let them handle the petty stuff. Let them handle the stuff that happens in the civil court and the stuff that happens in some of the lower courts. And you just, you just, you just serve as the Supreme Court. When something gets too big for these these smaller courts, then you start to judge those situations. And and so Jephro gave invested positively in Moses. Moses' leadership lacked in the area of kind of coming and building a nation. He was a new leader, and he led well in the times of crisis. But when it was time to settle things, he needed some leadership lessons. And Jephro, his father-in-law, began to build into him those leadership lessons. Early in my ministry, I would do house hospital visitations. And, um, and, and, I, and I just kind of figured that people wanted me there and, uh, and I was supposed to kind of be there and no one's showing up to work with them. And so I would stay there and I, and I, would, I would spend some time with them. And, so, and they say that I'm long-winded, but don't believe they because they don't know what they're talking about, right? So, so I would be there and, and one day Wesley, this seasoned pastor, Wesley Payton, went with me. And he went with me to the first hospital visitation. And as we were walking out of that visitation, he said, I th- how long are you going to be there? You're driving that person crazy. I said, no, they enjoyed my company. He said, no, they didn't. They were humoring you. They were done 10 minutes after you got in there. And Wesley began to give me insight that I did not have because he was a seasoned pastor. You know, we all need that. People who invest in us positively, people who have done it and can help us do it better. And so Wesley did that. And that's what Jethro did for Moses. He developed him as a leader. He questioned Moses' method, pointed out why it was not good. And then he offered him advice. He didn't say that Moses should stop judging He didn't say that Moses should stop being the representative of the people before God. He didn't say that Moses uh, shouldn't teach the people the law or how to live. He just helped Moses do what he was doing and do it more effectively and better. And here's the other thing that we learned for this story. Moses had to be teachable and reachable. Because Moses could have said, oh man, what are you talking about? Moses could have done his father-in-law, yeah, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening, and kept on doing what he was doing. After all, Moses was the one who led the people out of Egypt and, 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 out of Egypt and away from Pharaoh. He could have said, what are you talking about, old man? I'm the man. Did you just see what I did? Do you know what happens when I raise this rod up? God acts away from me, old man. No, he was teachable and reachable. 
And if we're going to be invested in and we're going to outvest in others, we've got to be teachable and reachable. So Moses listened to Jethro. And because he listened, he grew in the eyes of the people and his leadership was better. Sometimes it's just because we don't listen. We want to be know-it-alls, right? I mean, Moses had been used greatly. He had been leading the people. Um, you know, he, he, he could have just kind of blown them off, but that's not what he does. Moses didn't think that he had arrived or that he didn't need any help. You know, we all need help. You know that? We weren't meant to do this life on our own. We weren't meant to do this by ourselves. We weren't meant to kind of live life in a vacuum. We need help. And that's why it's so important to invest in others and, and be invested in because we all need help. And I believe it was because of Jephro's investment in Moses that he was able to outvest in Joshua. So Moses took what he received from his father-in-law and he paid it forward until Joshua, the next leader. And the thing that we see, first of all, is Joshua had this, he had, he had this great potential, right? Because Moses, Moses sends Joshua up to do one of the first battles to, to kind of fight against the Amalek, Amalekites. And, and here's an interesting situation there. So, so Moses and Aaron and, and, and them stay up on a mountain, and Joshua is down in a valley, and he's fighting. And Moses is holding up the rod of God, and every time the rod of God is held up, everything's going well. When it was fall, it, 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 they, they start losing. So Aaron and the other person hold up Moses' hand, and Joshua wins the battle. And once he wins the battle, he's given more opportunity to serve some more. Here's the reality. When we're outvesting in people, we see their potential and then we give them more opportunity as they begin to lean into the lessons that are being learned. God says to Moses, climb higher up on the mountain and wait there for me. I'll give you the tablets of stone, the teachings and commandments that I've written to instruct them. So Moses got up and accompanied by Joshua, his aide. Moses had already begun planning this thing where he would invest, outvest in Joshua. It wasn't by accident. It was on purpose. And so Moses, Moses climbed up the mountain of God and told the elders of Israel, Wait for, him, wait for us here until we return to you. You have Aaron and her with you. If there are any problems, go to them. Joshua was given more opportunity to learn and develop as a leader because he had proven himself. He was given more opportunity to go places. He went places that the 70 elders did not go. When mentoring or outvesting in others, we need to exercise patience. Moses didn't push Joshua too far ahead. He just let him walk through his natural pace. So Joshua is constantly learning and watching and growing and maturing. Joshua also learned some lessons of humility from Moses. There's a story that, that is found in Numbers where, where they're up on the mountain and, and, God's, and God, he takes the 70 elders up on the mountain and God's spirit begins to pour out on them and they begin to prophesy. And Joshua hears that people in the camp that did not come up on the mountain are prophesying and he comes to Moses and says, Moses, make them stop. And Moses says, what, what's wrong with you? Are you jealous for me? Let him prophesy. And Moses begins to share a lesson of humility with Joshua. You know, sometimes when people go too fast, they don't have the ability to take it in. Their, head became, their heads become big and swollen. And so Joshua, so Moses begins to outvest in Joshua by teaching him a lesson of humility. See, good mentors, good outvesters are secure in their calling and do not feel threatened by the gift of others. Good mentors, good outvesters don't envy when they see God using someone else. That's what Moses was talking to Joshua about. Good mentors, good outvesters don't need to defend their positions. 
We also see that Joshua, way from the beginning, had proved himself courageous. If you remember the story, they're going to spy out the land of Canaan. And, and, and Moses sends a whole group of spies there to spy out the land, to see what's going on. And all the rest of the spies are what I call Frady cats. Oh, they look at the size of the people there, and they, they talk about grapes being as big as men, and they exaggerate a little bit, but they were Frady cats. But Joshua, Joshua is one of the ones that came back and said, no, no, we can take this. We can take the land. He had already proved himself courageous. While others focused on obstacles, Joshua saw what the Lord could do for them. And because Joshua and Caleb, because they tried to convince the people to trust God, they were the two of the people, along with Moses and a couple other, that were allowed to enter, that were allowed to enter the promised land. Moses never got it. He got to see it. He didn't get to enter it. Joshua and Caleb got to enter the promised land because they trusted God. And then if you're going to outvest in people, you got to have this sense of succession. You got to have this succession plan. Moses had, Moses had started to, and God was working with Moses to have Joshua succeed him. You maybe remember the story, Moses dishonors God before the people. The story goes like this, that God one time in the desert has said to Moses, when people were yelling out for water and something to drink, God says to Moses, take the rod and strike the rock and water will come. And Moses does that and water comes and there's a miracle that happens in the desert in front of all the people. Well, there's a new generation that comes up and they're still doing the same thing, murmuring and complaining, still groaning and moaning about being in the desert. And that's the reason why they're in the desert in the first place, let me, let, me, let, me, let me give you a piece of a nugget here. Sometimes we're in the place that we're in because of our moaning and our groaning and our complaining. Sometimes our moaning and groaning and complaining keeps us in the same place that we are in instead of allowing us to go into the promised land that God has for us. There's something about moaning and groaning and complaining that, that keeps us from seeing God at his best and keeps us from receiving what we could receive from God by faith. And so sometimes the moaning and groaning and complaining has got to stop. And, and so they're, moan, they're moaning and they're groaning and complaining. So God says to Moses this time, speak to the rock and the water will come. You do understand the difference there. One is hitting the rock. One is speaking to the rock. Moses hits the rock, and because he hits the rock and dishonors God in front of the people, he cannot go into promised land. You say, James, that seems so petty. No, it's not petty, because God was getting ready to do a new miracle for a new generation. They had already heard about how Moses had struck the rock and the water had come. Their grandparents had told them that. But God was getting ready to do a new miracle. Imagine what happens if Moses speaks to the rock and the water comes and they say, a new miracle. He struck the rock back in my grandparents' day, but in this day, he just speaks to the rock. And so Moses begins to prepare Joshua to take the baton. There's something about succession. Moses begins to honor as he outvests in Joshua. He begins to honor him in front of the people. He begins to encourage him and, and challenge him and remind him that God would be with him. Great mentors, great outvesters know the importance of succession. God will ultimately choose the person, but we can help prepare the person that God has chosen. As we prepare our successor, we need to honor them and to do all to encourage them. Austin Gardner says this, we are not a success until we have a successor and we make them a success. Let me say that again. We are not a success until we have a successor and make them a success. And then the day comes when Joshua has to step forward and become the leader. And you remember the story where Moses goes to him and tells him to be courageous, to be courageous. And Moses basically lays his hands on Joshua and says, you're the man, you're the next one up. If we're going to invest and outvest, there needs to be this sense that we're preparing to pass the baton. I've been in ministry for almost 30 years, and I've, 
As I, I, as I move into this stage of my life, I realize that there needs to be people that I need to be outvesting in the same way someone invested in me. Some of the pastors who have invested in me, Enos Reeves, he was my first foster dad. He was a pastor, had a church. David Bowen, the pastor when I grew up. John Gwynn, Wilfred DeGrasse, Russ Metcalf, Bud Reedy, Mike Schutz, Mark Sanford, Gay and Buddy Marson, all pastors who invested in me. And I've lived my life trying to pay forward and outvest in others like Corey McPherson, Matt Riba, Kevin Donahoe, Pam Fontana, Alex Williams, Kerry Dillman, and many others, just outvesting in others. So let me ask you the question again, the question of the series, who's investing in you? And who are you out vesting in? Who's investing in you? And who are you out vesting in? Here's the reality. We all need to be invested in. We all need someone pouring into our lives. We all need these vulnerable, transparent relationships where we are teachable and reachable where we learn from others, where people are making positive investments in our lives. And you're never too old or never too young to be invested in. And you're never too old or too young to outvest in someone else. See, this is what it means to, to do relationship. This is what it means to be in the kingdom, to be belongers. And I'm afraid sometimes we do this thing on our own and we feel like we don't need anyone and nothing is further from the truth. I wanna challenge you and challenge us to write the question down and to begin to ask this question, who's investing in me? Who's pouring into me? Who can I be transparent with? Who, who, who wants me and wants to congratulate my success? And then, in turn, who am I paying that forward? How am I paying that forward? How am I investing in the lives of others and encouraging them and wanting the best for them and teaching them lessons of humility? How am I doing that? Whatever your career is, your passion, whatever God created you to do, your purpose, he wants someone to succeed you in that. You make that happen by answering this question, who's investing in you and who are you outvesting in? Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much that you made the greatest investment in us through your son, Jesus. And that investment made possible our ability to live in relationship with you. But Father, you knew that we would need people with skin, flesh, and bone on to invest in us, to encourage us, to help us, to show us the way. And so Father, you have, you have, you have created us for relationship. And so, Father, would you help us in these days to be willing to allow someone to invest in us? And then would you help us to outvest in someone else? Someone needs, someone right now could use our investment. Someone right now is waiting for someone to pour into them. And God, I believe you want to use us so would you help us to answer those questions? Now, Father, we, I just believe that all great relationships, all real relationships starts with a relationship with you. And maybe today, Father, there might be someone who does not have a relationship with you. And so they know nothing about real relationships. And the good news, Father, is even today, in this moment, they can begin a real relationship with you. By simply, Father, by simply saying, God, here I am such as I am. 
I've been doing my own thing, trying to do this on my own. I know I've messed up, and I've blown it, and I, I long to be in relationship. Would you forgive me? Would you come and live inside of me? Those kind, that kind of prayer, honest, sincere prayer, is the kind of prayer that God answers. And God will come and take you up on that request and live inside of you. And then there are people who have been around maybe for a long time and they need to renew that relationship. The relationship has gone old and crusty and maybe you've put on a Teflon jacket and that relationship needs to be like Velcro. And so you can pray a prayer like this. God, thank you that even though I've kind of pushed away from you, you've never gone away from me. You long to be in relationship, a Velcro kind of relationship with me. So here, am I, here I am, Lord, wanting to be in relationship. And then just thank him. Father, we just thank you that you're in the relationship business. You call us to a relationship with you and a relationship with others. Thank you for all you're doing in these days. And you know, we pray, amen. So who's investing in you? And who are you investing in? Write it down. Begin to pray about it. God will point out the people. You pray. I, 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 I'll make you this promise. You pray, God, I need somebody to invest in me. Pray it. Would you send that person to me? I believe God will send that person to you if you pray that prayer with honesty. Because he wants, he wants us to have these kind of relationships and then pray the second prayer. God, who, who needs to be invested in? How can you use my gifts, my graces, my experiences, the things that I've gone in? How, who, who can use that? Would you point me in, that, in the direction of that person? There are children here that need to be invested in. There are students here that need to be invested in. There are adults here who need to be invested in. And God could be, you could be the person that God wants to do that through. I'm excited about what God is going to do as we are invested in and we invest in others. God bless you. Love you guys.